Oklahoma City is one of the six most gang infested cities in America. After analyzing data from the FBI and municipal law enforcement agencies, the website came up with the following list of the most gang infested cities in America. Chicago, Illinois, Los Angeles, California, where I'm sitting right now, Detroit, Michigan, Camden, New Jersey, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and East St. Louis, Illinois. And on the line right now, I have an OG who is representing Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Ladies and gentlemen, Big Sin Dog. What up, OG? Man, what's up with it? Can't call it, brother. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for, for coming on my show, man. And um, I just want to remind everybody, you know, out there why I do this show. I do it, you know what I'm saying, not necessarily to glorify gang life, but to, you know, educate people you know, on the different hoods that are around the country and around the world. And me being from L.A. where, you know, Crips and Blood started, I always find it, you know, fascinating that people in Oklahoma, you know what I'm saying, are banging and just as hard if not harder than than we are um but uh og big sin um i guess uh let us know what the name of your hood is my man uh my uh man we sev 15th street it's better pronounced as southeast village crips you know what i'm saying we originated from down here in oklahoma city though okay okay now let's let's fast let's rewind a, a bit um let's rewind back to i guess the 80s when do you remember crips and bloods coming into oklahoma city well i already uh well my family had an affiliation with crips because my father was you know he was lightweight involved in the crips back in the day but down here in oklahoma city he really didn't jump off real tough until like 91. okay okay now your father was a crip from out outside of oklahoma yeah, he was um he's actually in Seattle, Washington in his younger days, so mm. he was affiliated with some West Side Crips up there. Okay, yeah, uh, Seattle, Washington was a big hub cuz it's just north of where I am. It's an easy drive up the 5 freeway and as we all know, the reason why gangs spread across America really was because of the spread of drugs and, and mainly crack cocaine in in the early uh, 80s. Um but talk to me a little bit about uh, the history of I don't want to get into your hood just yet, but just the history of Oklahoma City gangs uh, in, in general. Um, take me back to, you know, I guess the 91 where it really started popping. Okay, the way I look at it, man, because I've been down here, you know, on 10 toes flat, man. You know what I'm saying? I haven't seen it all. So to me, it was like a government conspiracy with us, too, is because I think that the movie started it all for some most of these cats down here. Colors. You know, like that colors and then with the Mexicans, it started with American and me. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? So when those movies really hit the town down here, it just got overpopulated with, you know, gang violence. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I've heard that time and time again, man. So before that, let's say before cause colors came out in eighty eight. Before that was yeah. was there any Crips or Bloods to be heard of in Oklahoma? tell you the truth we had like you know we had like um you know experiences with some people that was you know game banging like that but we really didn't take it to heed like that is because you know we was more of like a, a organization then mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying we was about you know stacking our chips and you know looking out for each other but when the gangs came in you know we represented our turf where we at you know what i'm saying instead of you know, claiming somewhere we ain't never seen before. Mm -hmm. okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I like that. Instead of like Crenshaw Mafia or. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, we ain't never been there before. So why are we go die for something we ain't never seen? How old were you when you joined your hood? Well, really, uh, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> it ain't nothing to be proud yeah, of, nah. nothing like that, man. Um,. You know, my brother started my gang. He was older than me, so it was either Fall in Line, Girl Scout, or be Steve Urkel. Which one you want? Mm -hmm. So I chose to fall in line like a Girl Scout, man. <laughs> so I was about like 11, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said your brother was an OG coming up before you? Yeah. No, nah, he the one who started my gang. Oh, okay. No shit. Okay. Yeah. So who are, who are um, you know, besides him, who are some of the people who came before you uh, in SEV? Oh, oh, my big homies, really, you know, it's just like, um, 
all the people that was around my brother's age, my brother is OG Finn, man, rest in peace. And, you know, I had big homies like Two Tone, Insane, you know, Big E, stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? D Hop, you know, we all gave ourselves, you know, local names after our own names. Okay. How'd your brother pass away, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, he got murdered down here. They found him in the lake, bro. Mm. So, you know, that was during the time where, you know, it was every man for himself type shit going on, man. Yeah, damn. Rest in peace to your brother, man. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So what what were the most craziest years down there in Oklahoma City? Oh, uh, I ain't gonna lie. We was going hard from like, i say from 93 at least to like 2005. It was really just like... Mm. It was, it was, you could get it brought to you if you wanted it like that. Okay. Now take me back to, to you joining your gang. You know, where you jumped in or were you just, you know, off top just part of it because your brother was, was in? <laughs> nah. We, you know what I'm saying? We do it just like they do it up there. You know what I'm saying? You get in the circle of your peers and see how long you can last with them guys. Okay. So you know, take me back to that day. Okay. It was just like. They was doing all the little guys around my age, you know what I'm saying? So it was just like they was, you know, sizing us up with the homies that's around our size or whatever. And, you know, we all got put in a circle and, you know, go for what you know. Okay. So after so after that, you know what I'm saying? Um, after you get, you know what I'm saying, your little lumps in, you know, they show you the way of survival. You know what I'm saying? How to get this money. You know what I'm saying? Respect the rules that's been laid in front of you. You know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, whether you get along with them or not, uh, name some of the biggest crip sets in Oklahoma City. Oh, I'm just keeping it real. Um, neighborhood crips are everywhere. <laughs> um, okay. Hoover crips are everywhere. You know, like... um. You know, shotgun crips, you know. All places, all, all hoods in L.A., that's so crazy to me. Yeah, then um, we got IFGs, the Blood Hood, you know, they pretty, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they pretty thick down here, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, them the main gangs from um, California that's down here that's, you know, kicking up dust, though. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that SCV, your gang, uh, they, they, they're more homegrown. They never really adapted uh, something that was bred somewhere else and, and brought forward um what what were your thoughts you know originally when you started hearing gangs around you pick up names that were from la oh man i'm just keeping it real with you um it ain't like them cats that started claiming it we actually had people from la come down here and put them cats on okay yeah speak on it you speak know what it. i'm saying because i know like a couple of dudes that I ran into that was from um, L.A. Um, this was back in, like, 92. You know, they was older cats, but, you know, I know they was the main reason of neighborhood Crips being down here. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And then um, I met a couple of OGs from Shotgun because, you know, we got a southeast side, a northeast side, a northwest side, a southwest side. And on the east side is where you're going to find, you know, most of the neighborhoods, Hoovers and Shotguns and you know, all the other sets that start they own. Mm. But, you know, most of them cats down here that's, you know, banging Cali sets, they actually had people from Cali to come put them on. Okay. And they probably went there because of the dope game. I'm exactly. Sense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're out here, you can get a key for a certain amount and then out there probably triple it or, or quadruple it. Yes, yes. I want to talk about mexican gangs also i'm in la and shit now it seems like 90 percent of, of la is is latino in in some way um talk to me about when you started seeing the latino gangs start coming in oh actually um we had we had um one of the most popular gangs grow up right with us Who's you know uh, we um they call gbc's it's pronounced grand body essentials okay you know, we on Southeast 15th. They was on Southeast 23rd. Mm. So, you know, we used to bump heads with them cats a lot until, you know, OGs got together and was just like, hey, we from the same part of town. We should be running people off our side of town instead of feuding with each other. 
And you know, um, oh, so you guys get you along? Know. Do you get along? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's good hearing yeah. that because in LA, black gangs and Latino gangs, fuck, forget about it. Um, it it just isn't happening. But yeah, that, that's she what actually, she actually, we get along with both of the uh, main Mexican gangs down here is because the drug trade play a big part in it. You know what I'm saying? Because how so? You know, it's just like okay, if if I'm copping from GBCs and we got Southside Locos down here, you know what I'm saying? If they see me copping from them, they're going to try to undercut them and give me a better deal than what they give me. You see what I'm saying? They ain't, they ain't got nothing to do with gangs. It's all about the exchange of goods and money. That's it. But yeah, they was, go they was going harder than Crips and Bloods at a moment in time down here too, though. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm talking about they was killing each other off for real. Oh, okay. Damn. Are you guys seeing a lot yeah. of Mexicans now in, in Oklahoma City? Oh, uh, man, we we gave them they all little, you know, they little spots. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they go to their sides of town and they bars and stuff. So, okay. you know, we respect their area. They respect our area. Okay. Damn, that's interesting that the OGs got together and, and actually talked it out. Because yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because it could have turned ugly because they just as strong as we is. But, you know, it just it just took two level-headed OGs to talk it out. And, you know, from their own, you know what I'm saying? Hmm. The money gang been cool between us. Damn, that's that's pretty. I, I love that fucking concept. That it, that's how it should be, because over here, yeah. over here, it's really uh, it stems from the jail system. You know that the MA doesn't get along yeah. with the blacks, and then that leads to the streets. And in LA, exactly. like I said, aside from a situation that just happened, I can't remember the gang in LA, and I'm not going to mess it up. But there was a there was a big uh, uh, Crip gang and a big Latino gang that had been warring for years, and they finally just got together. Um, so that was pretty monumental out here. Yeah, real talk. Yeah. See, but I did some research about y'all, man. It's just, um, you know, yeah, the Mexicans go get mad if you study fucking over them, though, man. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm just saying, you know, um, when you find something good, bro, you don't fuck it over. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Especially if you've been doing good business, you can always go back to that person if you don't feel flat. See? They gonna fuck with you. It's because the money you done spent. I like how you think, man. I'm telling you. Just in, just in general, blacks and Latinos should get together. If anything, and stop fighting each other and, and start fighting, you know, the oppressor. Man, you know I mean? the oppressor, for real. It's because, like, you know, now in this day and age, you know what I'm saying, I kind of, like, grew and saw what this world is really about. So I just try to give the youth some, you know, great advice to where, like, hey, man, it ain't all about that no more. It's all about, you know, Stacking your change, man, and taking care of your family now, because a lot of this shit is watered down now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah, they don't put they don't put the um. If you just look at it, OG, you know what I'm saying? Just look at your uh, situations around you, man. They done did that shit like they did up there in um California back in the day. They pushing these new drugs out here and getting these kids on them. Mm -hmm. And these kids is the one that's killing motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Real speak, shit. Preach, dude. I'm just, I'm just saying, because shit, you just look at the economy that's going on around you. Man, they done passed this gun law where you ain't got to have no permit and shit like that. They should have just said, fuck it. We gonna purge one day after you. Yeah, for real. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, oh, okay. Um, what what are the gun laws? Check. What are the gun laws like down there? Because up here they're pretty strict. I mean, I can't even walk out of my goddamn house with a gun. If you know, without no, I'm just saying paper. um that y'all um y'all got um y'all y'all got y'all all strixy down here. It's the wild wild west, bro. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> For real, I'm talking about an 18 year old could go in the pawn shop and buy a chopper. God damn. You uh, know what I'm saying? Mm -mm. For real. So I was just like, okay. These kids out here fucking with these drugs and then y'all letting them buy guns, that's a disaster. What are your thoughts on Takashi 6ix9ine? Uh, man, I'm going to put it to you like this, man. You know, I know some real bloods, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about some real down-to-earth bloods. Yeah. And he would have never been a part of that gang, bro. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> for real. I feel like I'm it's their about. fault. I feel like it's their fault for even like. No, nah, that's what I. That, I didn't want to say that in so many words, but Go ahead, yeah, man. it is their fault. Yeah. They should not have let this dude get in the vicinity of them. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's really their fault. <laughs> yeah, it's because, all right, you know, they say that you're supposed to, you know what I'm saying, see what your homie is about before you introduce him to the set. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that cat right there, his whole persona screams, you know, Look I'm not me. with Look this. If me. some, Yeah, if something bad happened, you already know, I'm going to tell it. You yeah. know, he got that persona in his face. Yeah, man. And at the end of the day, yeah. sad, that sad thing is a lot of people are getting locked up for years, and he's getting out in July. He literally man. looks like a clown. Yeah, he literally looks like a clown, and they let him within his vicinity, man. man. Yeah, I feel you. All right, last question for you, OG, and I want to thank you so much for, for coming on the show once again. Last question That's for right. you. Uh, what, what were your thoughts when you heard the, that Nipsey Hussle was killed out here? Man. Here's exactly what I was just uh, because I got peoples up there in LA, you know, they get along with six so mm -hmm. you know. I was just telling them, man, you know, when whenever you try to change your life and do right, your past always find itself a resurfacing in your life. You know what I'm saying? We don't know what that man did when he was, you know, out here banging for real. Mm -hmm. You know, it probably was a cat that, you know, he probably got at some of his peoples and they probably never let that shit go. Mm. But it was a tragedy in the Crip community, though, because mm -hmm. he was doing a lot of good shit for people, man. Yeah, yeah, he was. Dare, dare I say, I think it, it sounds like you were kind of saying that, that maybe it was some sort of karma, unfortunately, for what he probably did 10, 12, 13 yeah. years ago. Yes, yeah. I'm talking about it, it do find a way of coming back at you, though. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about just... And I'm talking about just when you change your life, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I don't know ah, people that's so that... true. Damn. That's so true, G. Ugh. Yeah. I'm just saying, man, I don't know people who gave their life to Christ, man, and end up getting killed the next week. Mm -mm -mm. And I'm just like, okay, that's, you know, your karma do come back and touch you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. But, I like how you think, well, man. Go well, ahead. I would love to do a part two, man. Yeah. I thank you for having me on here, yeah. man. R.I.P. Uh, Missy Hustle, Neighborhood Nip. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, thank you so much, man. I really enjoyed this. And like I said, I, I, I would love to have you on next month. And shit, we just hit the tip of the iceberg, man. I just want to talk, you know, gang <laughs> shit in general with you. So I appreciate you, man. I'll let you know when this video is up. And, and you have a great night, homeboy. I'll be, be close in touch with you. All right. You have a great night, too. You got my digits, homie. All right, OG Sin. Talk to you soon, man. All right, OG. Right, it's on. Ladies and gentlemen, from RBL Posse, we have Black Sea. Too short, you should come to our hood selling tapes. Master C was real cool, man. That was my guy right there, man. He wanted to sign us when we signed to Intermittent Minute Records. Really? He was trying to sign us to No Limit. But something had happened where them dudes end up jumping Tupac up in there. Yeah, JT and, uh, and all they little crew. Uh, yeah, them still more dudes were not playing, even uh. You know, we had a little problem with Nestor Farrell. We thought he was acting a little big headed at one of the shows one time. Like, Dre, that's my guy right there. Oh, my God, man. Because Mac Dre always made you feel like you was one of his best friends. And I was hurt, man. We lost him. Yeah, Bodie Water, them like our family members right there. The time it was a little commotion between our clique, 40 and call me. Well, we, 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 what's this going on? You know, like him and Quinn got into a little problem. Uh, about a year ago, year or two ago. Tell us about what the Bay Area hip hop scene was like back then. Uh, before RBL, you yeah. About like oh, after, when you were growing when we up, yeah. When you were growing up, and even before um, you guys hit the game. Before we hit the game, the hip hop scene, we was pretty much listening to a lot of East Coast stuff. Around that time, we was listening to like the Steady B. Um, who was it? Like KRS One and them, Biz Marquis. Uh, you know, listening to MC Light. It was a lot of East Coast stuff that we was off to. I mean, of course, like, like you know, world-class record crew, stuff like that back in the 80s. We was off a lot of that stuff. But that was pretty much the theme. We was pretty much trying to be like the East Coast, even when it came to, like, the strutting, the breakdance and all that stuff. You know, we was going inside vacant houses, ripping the linoleum up, you know, bringing it down to the block. You know, to the basketball court, trying to break dance, doing all that type of stuff. So, I mean, it was a pretty much um, a, a hip hop scene, sort of like you would look at, it like in the East Coast, until I would say until NWA 
came out and things changed up. Too Short was around too. I say when Too Short. It's kind of started with us with Too Short, I would say. Mm. Too Short used to come to our hood selling tapes. And um, we used to, I used to be at the basketball court and just watching him come through in a 6'5 Mustang with uh, one of my fathers, Big, Big Boo Boo, who was annoying. And yeah, he used to come hang out up there in our hill. And then one of his songs, he said, I give it up to my homies in Hunter's Point. Mm. So he used to come through Hunter's Point. And, and sell, sell tapes and hang out and all that stuff. He had a real tight relationship with a lot of the OG dudes up over there. So, yeah, we used to hang out with him a lot. And, um, yeah, that was, uh, pretty much the theme back then. Mm. And then, uh, I say after Too Short, uh, you know, people like 415, you know, with Richie Rich, yeah. D-Lo, Brother Broski and them came on the scene, you know, that was, uh, you know, this was all like pretty much like, during and after the uh, NWA era, it just starts changing over. You know, that West Coast vibe start switching up, and it just was a whole different vibe. And that from there, we kind of crossed over from listening to BDP and all them dudes, Big Daddy Kane and all that. We kind of graduated over to like, oh, NWA, okay, like we more relate to this mm -hmm. instead of that East Coast stuff. We was like, okay, they really talking our lifestyle. They talking about these projects. They talk about really growing up in the hood and a lot of stuff we could relate to on the east on the west coast as far as the type of cars they was talking about and, and you know the type of females they was dealing with it was more relatable you know so mm -hmm. it starts slowly changing around i'd say the late 80s like 88 89 you know around then mm -hmm. then you start then that starts coming with you start having dudes like uh from Dangerous Dame and, uh, you know, Aunt Banks, all his people, he was producing from Dangerous Dame, the Spice One, the MC Pool, um, uh, 415, like they were Richie Rich in them. And then it just started graduating to like, uh, Cool Nut, IMP. And then was like our heavy influencers right there. That's who really influenced RDL with IMP, 415, and NWA. And was our top three when it comes to the music. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there was a lot of, you know, it was the 80s and 90s, so, of course, there was a lot of funk going on in the streets. Um, how, I mean, how safe was it for people like Too Short or, you know, 415 and all them to go from hood to hood selling their tape? Um, Too Short, never, I mean, well, 415 and never came over to Hunter's Point or in the city. Too Short was the only one, mm. you know. He was the only one that used to come over there, but... But when five of them was pretty big, I'm quite sure they didn't really have a problem over there in Oakland, but they never, I never, I don't, as far as me, I ain't never seen them. They probably have, I don't know, but they, uh, I never really seen them over in Hunter's Point, you know, as far as moving units, but I don't know what they was doing as far as distribution, how they was getting their music out. At the time, I was just a fan. I didn't really pay attention to, to all that until later on, once I got into the game and started, uh, trying to run around doing the music but um yeah as far as two shows the only one that was really actually coming to the city from Oakland and Banks and a lot of them all them dudes Dangerous Banks the uh, uh Science One a lot of them they stuff you just go to the record shop on Thursday because back then it was a lot of mom and pop stores so yeah I don't I don't know exactly how they was uh pushing or what they was doing to get it out, but as far as coming to Frisco and moving around, not selling out the trunk, Too Short was the only one I know was doing that. Yeah, that's what I was saying, was Dan there one of the first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he, he was with the Dangerous crew with, with Short and them. You know, so, yeah, I forgot about Rat and Fog. Yeah. When I heard him on that white Too Short tape, it was, a, it was a done deal, and then I didn't hear him for a long time, and then I heard him with that Players Club. I'm like, that's the fucking guy from the Too Short song. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Forte is dope. Um, before we jump uh, into the music, um, because Forte, I believe, is from a different neighborhood than yours. Um, can you kind of give the people ideas of the different neighborhoods that surrounded you guys? Like the, we heard it in the Forte song, like the Sunnydales, the Fillmores. Um, can you, can you, can you give us an idea of the neighborhoods and? and yeah. Uh, uh, Frisco consists of uh, yeah different uh, hoods and stuff. It's about it's a lot of projects out there. Like you got, it's a lot of different. It's too many to name as far as the, the little, uh, you can call it subsidiary hoods. Like in Hunters Point, there's actually different neighborhoods that broke down in Hunters Point. Hunters Point is more like the district, the area, the community, and then you have different little projects in there. Like I'm from Harbor Road projects. And then you have West Point. Then you have Oakdale. You got different ones, but 
Hunter's Point is the main community, you know what I mean? And then you got like Fillmore. In Fillmore, you got different like VGs and Page Street, you got Virgos, you got OC Price, different ones, but Fillmore is the main community. So it's like Fillmore, Hunter's Point, Sunnydale, Lakeview, which is where Selsky and Cool Nut and all them from. Uh, you got Patrell Hill, you got Alamany, you got the Mission uh, area. You know, that's where like a lot of the Latino uh, people is from, as far as like people like Julio from Black and Brown, a lot of them. Um, and who else am I missing? Um, uh, VGs, you know, Valencia Gardens. Yeah, they had their section uh, up in there. So yeah, that's basically the main, I don't know if I, yeah, I think I said Sunnydale, Sunnydale too. Yeah. Sunnydale, then they had Geneva Towers back then too. It was uh, the Towers. Which they tore down now, so okay. that's not around no more. But yeah, that was pretty much that was that's pretty much the whole first huh. though as far as like the little urban hood hood yeah. little sections and stuff uh, up over there. And yeah. I was I was reading somewhere that I mean, for lack of better terms, you guys really wasn't fucking with each other. Um, people like JT, yeah. the bigger figure, was you know from a different you know uh, neighborhood. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, kind of explain that um, that relationship, and and I, if you guys are, I think you guys are cool to this day, right? Yeah, yeah, we all good now today. But back then, yeah, it was fun. Like I say, from eighty seven to like ninety two, it was straight. It was first old get street wars. It was just like a war going on between us. Uh, the Sunnydale, Hunters Point and Sunnydale, Hunters Point and Fillmore, Fillmore and Sunnydale. Then people started leaving, like we was linked up, we was real tight with Lakeview. Hunters Point and Lakeview always had like a little sister brother relationship where we was always pretty much tight because we had the same common enemy, which was Fillmore and uh, Sunnydale. So we kind of stood tight. And then later on in life, uh, Sunny there with Fillmo got kind of cool. Them two big turfs, so when they came together, they was like a powerhouse. They was kind of doing their thing. But um, yeah, we wasn't cool like JT. Rabbit Forte had his mama stand over there in Hunters Point, so he had like a pass. He was able to he was able to come over and hang out here and there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, you had a lot of uh, dudes from over there. Like Seth the Gaffler, like me and him got cool up at Law Cabin Ranch. And um yeah, we got pretty cool then. That's a juvenile we facility, there. right? Right. Okay. Law Cabin Ranch is a place where they send, send you like to do like the whole eleven months. You could do like eight months to a year there. And that was uh that was a uh, little juvenile detention center. And then Seth ended up getting cool at Seth the Gaffler from GLP. But yeah, we all went cool. We actually got cool. The war was going on. I actually lost my eye. I got shot in the eye hmm. by some sunny girl dudes doing a drive by, and that's how I lost my eye. A lot of people thought I was just wearing the iPhone, the, the eye patch. And I used to wear that's like just something that's an iPhone. I had statement for Mr. C death and all that, but it was actually me. Um, I got shot in the, during a drive by, hmm. and uh, yeah, I ended up having, I got a glass eye. My right eye is a glass eye and stuff. So. Can you, can, yeah, you, was, can you take us back to that night? Two ago, he, um, I got shot in the, during a drive-by. Mm. And uh, yeah, I, ended up, I got a glass eye. My right eye is a glass eye and stuff. So, can, you, yeah, can, you, was, can you take us back to that night? Yeah, it was actually in the daytime. It oh, was uh, Sunnydale dudes that came through. Uh, they had came through our neighborhood. They had came through the neighborhood. And start showboating on. Uh, we had a main street out there, sort of like how in LA they got Crenshaw, where everybody roll up and down, you know, the block, hanging out, high side, and having fun, doing all that type of stuff. And uh, pretty much the Sunnydale dudes, and we got a street called Third Street that the, uh, we was all hanging on after school, with everybody out there chilling. It was a hot day. Everybody messed with females, and it was like three carloads of Sunnydale dudes just decided to drive through. I wanted to, uh, you know, start pretty much like showing off, dipping their cars. Like when they when they dip the cars, it's like when you hit the gas, hit the brake, hit the gas, you start dipping like bucking it, like a horse. So they was doing that, showing off. And somebody threw something at their car, and one of the dudes jumped out, acting kind of crazy, like like he he just, they, I don't know, he just started like acting like he was ready to go there. We was out there deep too, and they was only like about probably ten deep. And, and three cars, they probably had about like probably 10 of them, maybe 11. They jumped out the car, 
big old rumble took place, you know, we start chasing them dudes off, you know, throwing pipes at them, bottles, and chasing them down the street, carrying their cars up. And, uh, you know, after it happened, you know, everybody pretty much came up to our neighborhood, to our project, and um, pretty much started talking about, you know, people would be saying, oh, man, I did this, I did this. You know, everybody gathered around talking about what they did and what happened, laughing, drinking, and them dudes came back and retaliating, and they hit the corner. All I heard was, ah. as soon as I turned around to look, dude was hanging out the side of the uh, car, the passenger side, leaning over the roof with a 12 gauge. God and damn. Was like, Boom. Pop, 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 pop. Yeah, and I just got hit uh, twice. Luckily, it was just all buck shots, and it was from a distance that oh. was spread. It hit me in the right side of my body. When I turned around, I got hit in the left side. But I had ducked down and ran low, and I went instantly blind. I knew as soon as I started screaming to my boy, like, man, I can't see no shot in the eye, I'm shot. Mm. And, uh, yeah, they just uh, rushed me to the back of my house, rushed me in the car, in, in the uh, side of the house. My mom came down there screaming. She's like, oh, yeah, I bleed. You a lot of blood coming out your eye. And I just panicked out, started panicking, and, and, you know, they ended up taking me in the car, took me to General Hospital, and, yeah, they ended up... Uh, like, yeah, man, your retina and stuff is messed up. We wanted to take the eye out. And like, we got to do surgery immediately because we don't cut it off. It can cause an infection and it can go blind in your other eye and this and that. And I was just like, huh. And my mom was getting okay. We had to take my eye out and then remove it. Yeah, so I ended up getting a prosthetic eye. Damn. Yeah, I ended up having an all white one for a couple months. And then that time, too, I ended up going to juvenile because they, as soon as I got to the hospital, they raided my house. I had like 10 guns in my house. And that's when I ended up going to juvenile and then going to the log cabin. Mm. And uh, yeah, LCR. So, I mean, that's when I ended up seeing stuff up there. We ended up getting kind of cool. You know, after the riots, there was a bunch of riots going on because we were, I mean. Riots in the, in the city or right in the city or in the uh, detention center? In the detention center, okay. it was like log cabin. Before I went up there, it was a few rides in juvenile, and uh, there was a bunch of Sunnydale and Filmo uh, dudes up in there with Hunter's Point Lakeview. And it's just like once everybody started hearing about the little war that was going on outside, uh, out you know, in the streets, it just got hectic up in the inside. People started just kind of retaliating, getting people, and yeah, it just spread all the way up to log cabin. And uh, yeah, it was crazy. And it was a crazy time, hmm. but um. Uh, What's so crazy is our album actually stopped the wars. You know what I mean? That lesson to be learned, man. Yeah. That's it's crazy. crazy. Oh, yeah, I want to jump into that. That was exactly what I was going to go go into next. Um, the year is 1992. Um, t first of all, I want to know, um, when did you, before we get into the lesson that we learned, when did you start producing? Um, and, and what kind of equipment were you using? And how did that whole process go down? Well, when I got out of Log Cabin in 90, I went to Log Cabin in 89. When I got out in 90, uh, while when I was up there, I was already getting kind of motivated because we was up there listening to Cool Nut. We was up there listening to that. When I came home, my boy Budweiser, uh, the rapper I was telling you about, he was doing uh, a little bit of rap. And uh, he was just like, man, Black, I want you to get behind me and try to, you know, do some music, you know? See, low rapping, I'm rapping like, man, we just need a studio, this and that. And they, you know, at the time I was having a little money. I was one of the young dudes on the block, you know, hustling and doing my thing. So, you know, I had a few chips stacked up. So I was like, all right, let's go to Pond Shop. I'm like, man, as long as y'all know what to get, I'll get it. And we go there. These dudes didn't know what to get. They just, yeah, we need a microphone. So, but the first piece of equipment I ended up buying was the task and full track. Uh, from the pawn shop. I didn't have no manuals or nothing to none of this stuff. I had the SB12, I had the Task Cam Full Track, the SB12. Uh, I had uh, uh, a little core keyboard. I had the Dr. Rhythm Boss, uh, it was a Boss Dr. Rhythm uh, beat machine. And what else did I have? I had, uh, the, I had the boss, uh, new Mark Mixer and a Technique 1200 turntable for sample. And that's pretty much what we started with. And we used to just kind of record on the phone track. I'll make the beat first. And I just kind of started playing with it. Because uh, Budweiser told me he knew how to mess with the stuff. Him and uh, this other dude named Double B, who uh, used to be in the studio, who was a rapper. They was like, yeah, we know how to work the equipment. We got all got on there and how to work none of that stuff. So I kind of self-taught myself. Really, after about a week, I already had a little thing for music because my mom had a closet downstairs full of nothing but... Uh, 
Parliament, Funkadelic, Roger, Zap, I mean, all the bands you could think of, man. It's from Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder. She had a collection down there. I mean, a collection, Cameo. And that's where all my samples was coming from, like off the first album. That was all my mama said, Prince, everything, you know. And that's all she used to do was sit outside with her doors open. With a big old speaker she used to drag to by her front door and just sit outside on the porch and just blast her little, all her little 12 inch singles and stuff that she had, you know, you know the, the extended version of Flashlight and One Nation under the crew. Right. She played everything. So right. that's pretty much how that started. And, um, and pretty much what happened was I was trying to get Budweiser and them going, get behind him and this dude named T Lo. And, um, they started faking every day. They know we'd make I make beats. They'd come up there, and then they would get to procrastinate, and then realize you know, they'd come in probably freestyle at first. They wasn't writing at the time. They was just going in there just some freestyle, and it was kind of kind of tacky. So I said, like, "Man, y'all need to start writing, man, so we can, you know, put this stuff out for real." And you know, make a long story short, Kilo started bullshit. So I started rapping. I just started. I made this song called "What About My Nigga," where I named everybody on the turf. And I put a song out called Rolling Through the Turfs of HP, where I was naming all the uh, the turfs in Hunters Point, pretty much to try to pull everybody in. I knew, like, man, if I name people, they going to want to play the album because they heard their name in it. And if I name these turfs, like all the little hoods in Hunters Point, they going to play it because they're hearing their hood up in there. So that's what I did, and that was my strategy, and it worked. And everybody's like, oh, Black, man, you sound better than Bro Wiser. You sound better than T-Mo. You need to be a rapper. Your voice. <laughs> It's dope, like man, you got a voice. There's something about your voice, and I was like, cool. He's like, man, you need to go press that stuff up. So you know, I ended up making a song called "Don't Give Me No Bama Joint." You know, smoke that shit in Hunters Point, and then I made a song called "Can't Say a Nigga Gay" from the East Bay. And at the time, I didn't realize Frisco was West Bay. I used to just hear oh, so okay. much, much of East Bay from the <laughs> Oakland cat that I made, but it, it took off. You know, I used yeah. the, the more bounce beat, and it, and it kind of took off. Everybody liked it, regardless of I was, you know, what I was saying. You OGs that told me like, man, you know this is West Bank. I was like, oh shit, I didn't even realize that. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of the younger dudes didn't even realize it. They thought it was the East Bay like me too. But um, yeah, that ended up uh, happening. And I was about to go to the studio, and I got—I mean, I told Budweiser like, man, I need to find a real studio. And he like, man, I know this dude named TC who worked with uh, Cool Nut now. He's like, he the one that record all Cool Nut stuff. All the IMP stuff, and I was like, "Oh, where they at?" He's like, "Man, in Lakeview, they got a little studio over there off of Ocean." I ended up hooking up with him, man. We need to uh, go over there and, and connect with him. And uh, we went over there, connected with TC. He like, "Man, I'm about to move my studio to Hunters Point." I'm like, "Oh, that's cool." He's like, "Yeah, just give us a sign." Cause so the lease is up on the building, you know. The dude Max Faces or whoever the dude that was putting out cool nothing at the time, he was about to sell all the equipment. TC let him have it. So, week later, about to get ready to go in there and uh, start on. Well, I think two weeks later, because he had he brought all the equipment over. And we went down and he was still hooking it up. But he, by the time we got in there, he was like, "Yeah, man, you know, y'all can book your time." I got a little, I got a little cold feet. I didn't want to do a solo album because that first electric to be learned was gonna actually be my solo album. Okay. But I ended up getting a little nervous. That's why it's a lot of solo songs that I, I kind of start off like a lesson to be learned. I got more like an orgy on there. Um, I got sort of like a cycle. It was a lot of songs that I was working on that I start off, you hear Mr. C come in last because I was working on my, it was going to be my album, Part of Survival, all that stuff was stuff I had already had that I was working on. And then, um, yeah, I got nervous and I was just like, oh man, I went to T-Lo, like, bro, I knew I'm ready to do an album with you. Let's do it. Cause I didn't want to fail by myself. You know what I mean? I didn't want to. He'd be like, oh, it's weak and it's that. But I was like, man, I need some real rapper to hide behind because I'm kind of more like a producer, but I'm doing this rap stuff for fun. But I want to get a real rap. Somebody who's going to actually be the lead rapper that I can get to be in the forefront to where I can kind of be behind them. So I don't have to, you know, if it do be weak, it won't be just my fault. So that's how that happens. So I end up... Um, uh, telling T Lo to come with me, and he was like, Ah, oh, man, I got a hustle, I don't want to do it, but I got this other rapper uh, that, that deal, uh, this girl I deal with, her brother's a rapper, and his name is uh, Kyle, man, but he called himself Mr. C. And I was like, Is he Kyle? He's like, Yeah, man, that's all he do is stay in the house and rap, man, and 
He's like, this dude don't be right like you be saying, telling us to do. He really right. He got pamphlets and stuff for raps. And so the next day, he brought him up there. Make a long story short, we end up uh, going. To, I end up. He came up here. We did one song called Hit Squad New Jack. And we was calling ourselves the Hit Squad at the time. And then we end up later on finding out that EPMD got the Hit Squad, so we had to change our name. So T Lo ended up giving us the name Ruthless by Law. He was like, man, why don't y'all just use Rufus by law? And I was like, oh, that's kind of dope. You know, I didn't even really understand though, the meaning behind it, whatever it just sounded dope. I was just like, okay, yeah, Rufus by law, that's dope. And he was like, yeah, man, y'all, y'all, you know, Rufus by law. And I was like, all right, cool. So we ended up taking that down to TC and started uh, working on a Lesson To Be Learned album, man. And the RDL Posse actually came and we, and we started taking pictures for the cover before we even finished with the album. And uh, name. I ended up, yeah, I ended up telling, yeah, it was a long name, so I was just like, man, you know, I had a few of my dudes get in the picture with us, and I ended up like, yeah, let me shorten it to RBO Posse, because what I was trying to do is capture that NWA-ish type uh, oh, album cover. Yes. I was like, man, looking at NWA, and then, you know, it's like, when you got four or five people on the cover, they all in black, they all looking like, you know, they coordinated like... That kind of captured people's eyes. So I was like, man, I don't want to just be with me and Mr. C on the cover. So I asked my other partners to get in, and they stepped in the picture, and that's when we ended up making names. I'm like, man, we're going to call it RBL Posse. You're looking like a Posse on there. Nice. And yeah, so we went and finished the album off. We already had our pictures and stuff. We had a few pictures we took on the mail jeep. We had a few pictures we took on the project buildings, and the one that stood out to us was the one in our basketball court that ended up standing out, and that's the one we ended up using. Yeah, everything was lovely, man. It, it just worked out well, and that fucking album just took off and it hit the streets. It just, the first thousand I pressed up, Gone. shot out and just sold out, man. It was in like two days, the stores was calling me back. I ended up uh, taking that money and pressed up 5,000. When I pressed up that 5,000, uh, and the mini records came knocking. And that's what uh, ended up, they just led us to a deal in a minute, which was a shitty one, but. I mean, it got us a little, he got us out there. I will give him credit for that, for getting us out there. Mm. Let me ask you, um, what's, what city or what area in the country besides the Bay showed you guys the most love? And I know you guys went on a tour, right? Who did you guys go on tour with? If you can answer those two for me. We were going to tour with, uh, uh, by ourselves, and then when we came back, we went on tour with Andre Nicotina, with oh. Dre Dog at the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and what's, we what's, helped him out. What area showed you guys the most love? Man, the most love we got, the most most love was Detroit. Damn. The whole okay. Michigan. Flint, huh. Flint, Michigan. Interesting. Pontiac, Michigan. Oh, my God. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Pontiac, uh, Lansing. I mean, all, man, that whole, the whole Michigan. From Detroit, Pontiac, Flint, Lansing, the whole, man, we used to be out there just, man, we lived out there. They loved us out there. I couldn't believe it. Oh, that's dope. I mean, we would get a little tour around there too this was before mc Bree. well mc Bree was hot at the time but this was uh around the time with mc Bree. it was a girl that girl i don't know if you remember the girl called boss yeah of course from she, detroit yeah we talked about her on my yeah. show a couple weeks ago yeah boss was out at the time man we did a few shows with her it was like a little mini tour plan we had out there it was night man oh it was nice yeah man but yeah, I couldn't believe it either. I was like, wow, all the way over to the Midwest, you know, skipped all these other states, all the way to Detroit. Like, Interesting. They just kept nonstop booking us, booking and, us. And you know how that's... of course, Seattle. You know how that started. Portland. You know how that started. Somebody probably had a cousin that lived in Detroit. He went out and visited him, took that, took your tape out there. He's exactly. like, damn, man, who was this? And then he recorded it, then another person recorded it. and that, exactly. That's kind of fun. But you said Seattle, of course, that they're kind of your neighbor. Who else? Right, Seattle, Portland, Oregon, Portland, and then uh, besides, I'm coming to come on. Besides Barry, Barry was yeah. eating it up. But I'm just besides that, it was uh, mainly like uh, from Detroit, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, um, and uh, I would get it to like Phoenix, like Arizona next after that. Okay. That was like our our hot market. Okay. Yeah. Damn. Then we go hot spots. Well, I want to um, I want to give you if you can give me like ten more minutes. I just want to um. I just want to name a few people and, and you, you know, give me a nice little short story or a thought, you know, or something that that comes to your mind. Um, uh, what about, did you ever run into Tupac? No, nah, I never met Tupac. I've seen him, though, uh, 
shit getting chased up out of the stone in Frisco <laughs> by oh, the Gilmo dudes. Oh, Gilmo damn. dudes. Yeah, JT and, uh, and all they little crew. Uh, yeah, them Gilmo dudes were not playing, man. Them Gilmo yeah. dudes. They, they used to be bullies back in the day. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. They, they, was, they was crazy. They, them dudes had some... Even to this day, JT and all the dudes I know from Filmo, they they still the same. Filmo <laughs> got so much Filmo pride, man. It's a fool. Uh, he was telling the story about it. Quinn did one of the interviews and told the whole little inside story. I wasn't inside the building, but I pulled up afterwards because there was a show a week after we did our show. We had a show with uh, Andre Nicotina, uh, um, uh, Totally Insane, and GLP. And it was uh, probably one or two other groups we did at the Stone on Broadway at Frisco. And then, uh, yeah, a week later, they booked uh, the governor uh, from Oakland uh, and Richie Rich. They was doing a show and they brought Tupac. And, yeah, it was some shit had happened. I, I don't know exactly what happened, but something had happened to where them dudes ended up jumping Tupac up in there and chasing out the building. I just seen the records afterwards, them come running out. Mm. I was like, damn, what's that? And that's Tupac Digital Underground. I'm like, what? And like, yeah, the film of dudes is only. God damn. Yeah, but I never met him personally. I never had a, got a chance to meet him. Oh, okay. No, right. at all. No. Um, Master P, he kind of had uh, his start in the Bay. Um, do you have any Master P stories? Yeah. Yeah, Master P was real cool, man. That was my guy right there, man. He came and uh, he really looked out for us. He actually wanted to sign us when we signed to Inner Minute Records. Really? He was trying to sign us to No Limit. No shit. Yeah, he was trying to sign us, yeah. Back but, in 92, uh, before No Limit. It. Before No Limit was a thing. Uh, yeah, right? it, was 90, it was 96. Okay. He, was already, he was cracking in. By gotcha. 96, he was cracking. This was like 95, I mean. Ah, gotcha. When he was working on the deal in 95. He had already moved back down there and kind of was already, you know, making his waves and stuff. So, yeah, but we just didn't, we didn't think it was a good fit. We were like, nah, you know, I don't think that we, plus our dream was to make it have that stamp of, uh, of a certified label like Atlantic or Capital oh, okay. gotcha. or, you know, Electra or something that, you know, that you've been growing up seeing. So I didn't want to just jump on Intermittent, I mean, on, on No Limit when I was already leaving an Intermittent Records, another independent company. I wanted you know, we had Relativity Records at us at the time. We had Def Jam. We had too many options that was just at us to where, you know, Master P was just like, you yeah, know, we don't want to do that. But, okay. yeah, Master P was cool, though, man. He was a real good dude. Came and got us for both his compilations. He always showed us love when we ran into him at Intermittent Records because he was over there at Intermittent Records, too, for a minute, mm. doing a few deals with Jason and them. Good dude. Oh, really? Man. I got nothing but good, positive thing to say about Master P. That's my guy. Good shit. One of my favorite uh, rappers of all time, E-40. Yeah, 40 Water, them like our family members right there. Back in the days, man, we did so many shows together, ended up in so many places together. We, you know, that's like our, damn man, like our fucking brothers. Yeah, uh, my boy OG partner of ours introduced us to uh, E-40 and then back in the days before we even came out with our album. Uh, we was hearing little demos. We was hearing like Mr. Flamboyant, mm -hmm. that song Left Side and all that stuff with a click. You heard a lot of that stuff before it even came out on, on actual on record and everything. So before it came out on cassette. But uh, yeah, the dude named Brother Hamp, OG Brother Hamp, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah 40, them, all them like B-Shot, B-Legit, Sugar T, all them, man. Sully said all of them, man. They like family members, you know. Yeah. To this day, we still tight, still cool. Never had no problems. You know what I mean? Anytime there was a little commotion between our clique, 40 would call me. Bro, we, 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 what's this going on? You know, like him and Quinn got into a little problem uh, about a year ago, a year or two ago, and 40 called me right up. Man, what's up, black man? Why don't you reach out to Quinn, man? You know, he on Facebook, and Instagram, tripping. Oh, woo, woo, really? You know? Huh. Yeah, yeah, and he ended up getting at me, and... You know, we squashed that shit real fast. And, you know, even, uh, you know, we had a little problem with Nestor Farrell. We thought he was acting a little big headed at one of the shows one time. And uh, one of our dudes, I guess, reached out to 40, like, man, you know, black and them like kind of, you know, kind of mad at Neff, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was acting, I guess, like a, a star, you know, trying to act a little big headed towards him when they was trying to take a photo. 40 called me the next day. Man, I got Nestor Farrell on the phone, man. And, 
Like, you know, I can't, you know, let y'all be leaving feeling some type of way, man. I had to call you as soon as I heard him out, and, you know, we, you know, squashed you right then. That's how tight we is, you know. Oh, that's we don't cool. let shit escalate at all in my family members. I love hearing shit like that, man, because we already know dumb shit can happen at, at the drop of a hat. Mm-hmm. That, that's dope as fuck. Yeah, so it's good. I fucked with Big Lurch, um, and we all know he had that situation where he was supposedly high on PCP and ended up eating part of his girlfriend. Right. Um, did you uh, explain your uh, relationship with him? Uh, it was mainly just a studio relationship. Like, I met him through Mike Mosley. Um, I was over there dealing with Mike Mosley for the Eye for an Eye album, trying to get some tracks from him. And um, Lurch was there every day. And uh, he was just in there rapping and rapping. And I was just like, okay, dude, got a dope-ass voice, a tight-ass style. And uh, Mike Mosley was playing me a few beats, and he ended up playing all every beat he was playing me. It was like Rick Rock. It was a Rick Rock track, and he was like, man, I'm just going to hook you up with Rick Rock. So he ended up putting me in, in the studio with Rick Rock. I ended up getting about five or six tracks from Rick Rock, and Big Lurch was real tight with uh, Rick Rock, because I guess they was working on the Cosmic Slot thing, they little group thing. And, uh... Yeah, I ended up putting him on the album with us because it was the song uh, that we did, How We Come, it was going to just be me, Hitman, and uh, Mystical. And Lurch was just rapping his heart out like, Black, man, I need to get on this track, man. You know, man, I'm loving y'all shit. And, man, you know, I'm a fan of Mystical, man. This would be a dream come true to get on that, you know. And I was just like, man, this is like some of the dope first, bro. I just don't want it to be too long. He probably don't make me single. And he came with that verse. He was undeniable. I was like, oh, shit. That's yeah. the dude. He, I said, like, you on the track. <laughs> you <laughs> on it now. <laughs> I said, without a doubt, he was, man, that boy came in and spit that shit. I was like, whoa. Like, okay. But yeah, that was uh, as far as our relationship with. We didn't really hang out away from the studio. We just kind of met that day. It was cool. And I was kind of, you see, I stayed tight with him just mainly through Rick Rock. You know what I mean? Okay. But uh, he definitely folks, so. though. Okay, and last name I want to throw at you, um, not just a Bay legend, but now just an iconic hip-hop legend, period, uh, Mac Dre. Mac like Dre, that's my guy right there. Oh, my God, man. I, I, I mean, every every rapper in the Bay probably got a story with Mac Dre, man, and loving to death. Because Mac Dre always made you feel like you was one of his best friends, you know what I mean? Like, he really, like, no matter how big he was, like, like dude, our first show we had with him, when he had this guy out of jail, he made, he embraced me so much. And I was like, man, I used to listen to this dude, California Living, I used to be just hustling on the block. I used to be listening to him. And now it's like, he out a big-ass fan of us. He's like, man, I'm a fan of y'all shit. He like, black man, I love that shit. They don't give me no guy. He singing that shit word for word, singing all our songs. We had a show at the, uh, the theater out there in Fresno. And man, he got up there doing his little dance and all that little shit in the back while we was on our side. Man, that is my guy. Him and Kilo and them, that is my fucking guys, man. I, man, I was hurt, man. We lost him, man. Because he, no matter what he was doing, he would sit down after a big show, everything. I mean, he came to our room. You know, we done had about three, four shows together. Okay. He would pop up at our room, knock on the door, come in, hang out. And it's like females out there, people chasing, looking for him and all this shit. Like, he like, I'm getting there hanging out with my guys. Like, he'll come hang out, chop it up with you, give you that hour, 30, 45 minutes of talking time where it ain't no bullshit. Where you just sitting there really chopping up like, man, you my homie. And he made you feel good, man. That's one thing about him, man. He always embraced it no matter what, no matter where we was at, no matter... If he was headlining or wasn't headlining or whatever, man, he showed the same love and he never changed from the time I seen him when he got out, when he was building himself up, even though he was always hot, but he didn't have that movement rolling like a fucking big ass tsunami until later on. Even when he was at that tsunami stage, he still was the same motherfucker, man. I love that dude to death, man. That dude was so fucking cool, man. Yeah. Cool as shit. I could hear it in your voice, man. Like, I could really hear it like, yeah. in your voice, how much you, you, you appreciated that dude being in your life. That's dope as fuck, uh, man. Oh, man, I, I'm, I'm blessed to just at least have a few stories where I just sat there because I hear everybody in the Bay, oh, man, sure, yeah, man, that was my guy. That was, man, that was my uncle. He did this and we were together, and it's like, I got to say, I, I see why everybody feel like that. Because when you come in contact with him, man, 
he give you that he you know he give you that attention. Yeah. He don't just brush. You got some dudes who get on their little pedestal, get on their little high horse, and they get a little funny. They start acting a little funny and shit. And they change once they get up there. And you be like, man, when you was a small guy, you was kind of like, you know what I mean? You was, you, you was listening to the motherfucker. You, you was giving me your ears. You was giving me full attention. Now you big. It's kind of like you, oh yeah, high and You try to brush your motherfucker off. You know what I mean? Hmm. And I didn't. That's what I didn't like uh, uh, about it. It's a lot of these dudes. I ain't gonna say no name, but it's a lot of big dudes who like that. You know what I mean? Who done made their way up, and you know now they acting a little funny. But Brand Dre up. never was like never. that. Never, uh. never, man. You just gave me chills, yeah. man. Being a hip hop nerd, you just gave me chills, dog. That's that's dope as fuck. Just breathe. 